Everybody, so it's time to start. Let's start with a little prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Mother Mary, Queen and Mother of our family, thank you for bringing us here all tonight. Help us to be enlightened by the great blessing of truth. And help us also to be able to have hearts and minds open that we may have a blessing in this in this talk, and we ask for a blessing upon everybody who is here, that we may better understand and help to be able to promote true peace, a peace which only you can give. Thank you, dear Lord, and bless our time together. And we entrust it to our dear Mother Mary as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, Queen of all hearts, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, well, thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. Um, for some of you who know me, some of you don't, I am Deacon Anthony. Uh, I am honored to be here tonight with all of you. Okay, now, I like to interact. Okay, so I will actually be calling on some of you all to answer some questions, to interact. Yeah, so front row people. <laughs> but <laughs> I want to start, and it'll be great. Don't worry, we're all friendlies here, so don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Um, I want to start by just telling you a little bit about myself. So as you all know, I've recently been assigned here at Holy Trinity. Uh, my day job now is for Sophia Press Institute for Teachers. And a lot of the times I go around the country somewhat giving this seminar in an abbreviated form in different forms like this um, because there's a lot of questions about this. What is it? So I, I want to be able to do it. And um, I'm going to get through as much as I can. But if you have questions at the end and you want to talk, come and talk with me, okay? Now, to start off with, this quote, I love this. This is Archbishop Oscar Romero. He's a saint now. But he said, you cannot reap what you have not sown. How are you going to reap love in our community if we only sow hate? And so that we can sow love, not hate, we got to start off on the right foot. Now, I'm going to walk through this. This is going to be the kind of the outline of our talk here, just so you all know where you're going. Fulton Sheen, he once had a, a saying, he was telling this story, and there was this speaker and he was given a talk about the 12 minor prophets. And it had been two hours and he had only got through the first prophet. <laughs> so then he says, he saw he was losing people, so he says, all right, so give me a little umph. And now, and now, We'll talk about Habakkuk. Where shall I put Habakkuk? Somebody raises his hand and says, he can take my place, right? <laughs> so I'd I like for you all to know where, you're, where I'm going with this. Um, one, just so you can kind of know where you're to focus in. You might have questions about a certain topic and stuff. Um, by trade, I, I do a lot of teaching. So that's where I, I think of you all as students. So. I want to know where you're going. So we're going to look at ideology versus person. That's the first thing. Then we're going to look at examples of critical race theory in society. Then we're going to look at kind of we're going to do a rewind. How did we get there? Why is this even a topic now? Right? So we're going to look back at history. Then we're going to look at God's picture for all of us. Then we're going to contrast critical race theory, CRT, to Catholic worldview, and then we're going to end with solutions. Okay? We're going we're gonna to do all of that in about, an, hopefully, an hour and 15 minutes so it can give you time for questions, okay? So are you all ready? Yeah. All right. So imagine I'm out here, right? And I said, look, I need for you to stand firm and don't let me knock you over. Like, you know, when you're bringing your children to the beach or something like that and the waves are coming and you're trying like, okay, stand up, stand up, right? Mm -hmm. You need to have both feet in the ground. 
What happens if I just stand on one foot? I can get knocked over a little easier, right? The problem is a lot of times with this issue, we're only standing on one foot, which is our emotions. We need to have both feet down there grounded in truth, in reality. So what, oh, no worries. So what we're going to do, just so you know in truth, I am going to use firsthand sources. All right. I'm not going to say what people are saying. I'm going to use firsthand sources. So just so you all can see this, right? All right. This book this is for the camera here. All right. <laughs> all right. I'm using a firsthand source, and I'm going to quote from firsthand sources like Ibram Kendry, How to Be an, uh, how to be an Anti-Racist, or White Fragility. I'm going to quote from them. So you know that this is not just me, Deacon Anthony, saying stuff about them. I'm going to use their own words, okay? I also am going to use another group of people's words, the Catholic Church. They're great. So you can know that this is church teaching. This is not just me projecting this. This is actually church teaching, all right? And this we get to the right foot. So now let's look at some examples of critical race theory. What are some examples that you all may have heard of critical race theory. I'm just trying to get a feel of where you all are. That's what I'm asking right now. It's like hatred between oh. the different races. Okay. That's all the right. main thing. Okay. All right. And that's what you need to create chaos. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to get to all of that in a second, but we got to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> she said, uh, so let me repeat it. She said, she says it's a hatred between races. Okay. All right, yes. Okay. And ideology. Yes, okay. And has anybody heard of any examples? Like if I said, give me an example of, of it in society. Because, and the reason I say this is because sometimes when I'm talking with people about this, they'll say, well, this stuff doesn't even, even exist. You know, there's, this is just in people's imaginations, right? So that's why I'm asking you. All right, so. Well, what I've heard is, historically speaking, you know, because uh, the, country was founded with slavery, that type of thing or whatever, there's been a, a, a natural predisposition of white people to go ahead and consider black people to be inferior. That then colors their actions and their assessments and, you know, everything, if, if, you know, if, whatever. If I, if I see a, a black kid and a white kid walking into a store, I'm yeah. going to pay attention to the white kid because obviously he's there to shoplift. Yeah. White kid is, and so on and so forth. Yes. Okay. And, and that is that is a, a good example. We're going to look at these lenses and stuff that people are coming. Okay. Yes. Critical race theory is part of the official doc, official goal as a state of Virginia. It's in our. It's 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 officially in there that teachers have to teach critical race theory, starting in kindergarten, all the way to twelfth grade. And as a result, you're seeing all kinds of screaming, yelling. The school board meetings in Loudoun County, Fairfax County, and even and Prince co William. counties in Colorado and Prince William mm -hmm. against it. Yes. I think the whole 1619 project is the manifestation of all this big stuff. Oh, that's a, that's, a, that's a good example, the 1619 project. Yes, okay. Would an example be something like white privilege? Okay, yes. Talk about white privilege. Yes. Like to his example of comparing races. Yes, okay, the white privilege, yes. Okay, yes, yes. He said institutional racism, institutional racism. Yes, all of these, you're, you're hitting on some of these things. Now, one of the things that I, I first like to start off, first and foremost, is saying this. This, I'm going to read this, and we're going to come back to this slide. But just for, again, starting off with, we're starting off with first front row people here. All right? You're going to see... Can you see that this is highlighted in this book? All right, I, just so you all know that I, I'm, I'm not making this stuff up, okay? This is literally highlighted, okay? We're going to come back to this, but with CRT, the critical race theory, I'm going to read the first part, and then we're going to read the next of it. It says that it's a movement, because a lot of times people say, oh, well, they're not teaching it in schools, and, and they actually are. But because they can say it's a movement, you can't say when somebody says, well, show me where it is in our curriculum. You can't really do it because it's a movement. 
Now, I'm going to I'm going to share with you actually you can show where it is in curriculum. I'm going to give you some examples, right? But for the average Joe Smo when they're talking about this, they're going to say, "Well, it's a movement." So, how do you know that's critical race theory and that's just not your idea? This is why I'm showing firsthand documentation of this stuff, okay? Now, it says it's a movement, a collection of activists and scholars engaged in studying and transforming the relationship among race, racism, and power. Again, this is coming from here. The movement considers many of the same issues that the conventional civil rights and ethnic studies discourses take up, but places them in a broader perspective that includes economics, history, setting groups, self-interest, emotions, and unconsciousness. Okay, so in other words, and we're going to stop there for this part right now. In other words, this movement is meant to go into all of society. Right, so it's something that's meant to transform society. It comes right out of here, page three. All right. Oh, oh yeah, so this source, this is called Critical Race Theory and Introduction. It's by Richard Delgado. He's one of the people that actually founded the movement. I'm going to get into a little bit of the history of the movement. Yes, yes, yes. These are all. And you're going to show us the. Yeah, I'm going to show the contrast. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so. Yes. So you can see both sides, you know, just what is going on here. Okay. So examples in society right now churches. There's a Chicago church, the First United Church, that says it was going to fast from whiteness for Lent. And I'm not making this up. I, I have all of this stuff cited. I'm not making this stuff up, okay? We're going to fast from whiteness for Lent. I mean, yeah, this is, yeah, this is, I mean, the military, the Air Force Academy in Colorado, all right? They are offering a diversity and inclusion minor. The learning objectives in their third and fourth learning objective for this minor. Analyze, synthesize, and apply a broad range of theories, okay, of theories, methodologies, for the critical study, the critical study, of diversity and inclusion, including how diversion, diversity and inclusion change in varied historical and social contexts. So you can see that this actually is this is right from their website, okay? So you can see their, their website, okay? Just so you can see that I'm taking it from the website. Okay. Next, you have the University of Virginia, their School of Medicine. Okay. They have a Department of Cell Biology Anti-Racism and Inclusion Initiative. They're saying that as scientists, we have to stop being racist. We're focusing more on focusing on helping white people than people of color. We need to find a solution to this. Okay? So they have critical race theory in the medical schools. Okay? Next, and curriculum. This actually is a National Association of School Psychologists. They have lesson plans on privilege, which they're supposed to teach throughout the nation. This, show it to you here, is this. All right, so this is coming right off of their website, the National Association of School Psychologists. You can see the objectives, okay? Talking about, they have lesson plans on privilege, how to teach it, how to talk about oppression of certain groups, and it goes through. So this is in curriculum. They're also, in Colorado, they have a pre-college course about critical race theory. Now, this is the teacher right here, Heidi Lewis. Now notice what book she's using to teach this. Right? They're teaching this at the school, in this college. So it's a, it's a high school course that's going for college kids. Okay, primary schools in Manhattan. An East Side community high school teacher passed out this chart along with its definitions and asked the parents to reflect on 
their white identity. It ranged from, and you can't see this up here, but I'll read it from you, white supremacists to white abolitionists in the green. This white voyeurism, white privilege, white benefit, white confessional, white critical, white tailor, and then white abolitionists. Those are your eight white identities. They said for parents, you need to look at this and turn this in so that we can operate as a school. Of course, the parents were very upset about this, okay? Thomas Jefferson in Alexandria, they had, they had an, uh, a, some of the parents were kind of doing some research about this. They said, hey, we want to have a talk and a training on racism as a structure. But then they saw, some of the parents saw these three yellow stripes there. They're like, what's those stripes for? Those stripes are also how Black Lives Matter, that's part of their emblem. Right? So they, they went and they did this. The principal sent out that notice, but you probably saw on TV some of the parents yelling about this and what they were taught in class. So now, they have a website. There's so much that this is involved in, that this critical race theory, they actually, people have set up a website that actually can tell you what is going on in the country pertaining to this. So this is the actual website, criticalrace.org. You can see they can talk about, okay, here's some elite private schools, higher education, medical schools. They do congressional um, bills on this, and they can tell you what is going on. So see if it's, it's interactive. See, higher education. Notice all the states are highlighted now. Okay, medical schools. All right. Um, and you can scroll through these, and I've, if you... Type on a, a link. You can do anything you want. I mean, I'll just pick up one. I'll just pick one randomly. Barry College tells you about the school, gives you information, and then it talks about what is going on. What are they offering, okay? So you see, and you can do this for almost any state that we have in the United States here. Okay, so that's a, a nice resource. But... Why is there so much to do about critical race theory? How is this exploding? Why is it, you saw me when I went to math, that every state now in their higher education is implementing this in some way, shape, or form? Why is this getting so big? To answer that question, we gotta go back to some basics. What is race? Right? Because a lot of people, they may get that wrong. What is racism? Why do we need to be critical about different aspects and approaches? And to be clear, we do need to be critical about how we apply things, but in a good way. Okay? What does the church have to say about all these issues? This is going to be my next part of the talk. Okay? So we're going to start off with some definitions here. How did we get here? Well, if I were to ask you all, okay, what is a race versus what is an ethnicity? Is there a difference? If now, this is one to interact with you. If you say yes, raise your hand. If you say no, raise your hand. If you didn't raise your hand, raise your hand. <laughs> All right, now, so race, so race generally includes your biology, all right? That's the, more of the outward signs, okay? Your biology is your race. But then your ethnicity is more of your culture. What's happening, what's happening is people are conflating these, and then it's angering people, right? So, like, let me ask for an example here. Like, uh, who here is Latino? Raise your hand, okay? Who here is Asian descent? Raise your hand. All right. Who here is Caucasian? Raise your hand. All right. Now, watch this, because a lot of people don't realize this. If you are Caucasian, raise your hand again. 
It's actually a race. Right. It's a race. It's not about yet. Mm -hmm. The Caucasus Mountains actually intersect Europe and Asia. I'm guessing most of you all are not near from somewhere near Russia. Am I right? All right. Okay. Well, maybe. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Touche. Touche. <laughs> but you can see, like, when people are saying, hey, you know, I'm black, I'm Caucasian. And then people are saying, well, all those people, maybe you are from that area. That doesn't mean everybody who has your same skin tone holds that same cultural view. Right? So, like, and I'll give a perfect example. Like, when people say to me, like, okay, yeah, okay, you're black. Now, if we're talking about that as a cultural thing, what does it mean to be black? Some people think of black as kind of the lock, drop, and roll generation of, like, MTV. But then there's blacks. They're like, no, I actually think being intelligence is good. Right? What does it mean to be this specific culture? That's where we're having a little bit of the wars here. But in order to get to the race, all right, and racism, we have to look at, okay, what is going on here? Now, a racist is a person who believes that one race is inherently superior or inferior to another. Right? Is that good? No. All right, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, racism is not good. When you think that someone is inferior or superior to you because of the color of their skin, that's bad. Right? So racism is the act of perpetuating those ideas. Now, there have been examples of racism. Okay? Now, again, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing in the bird's eye view here. Who here has ever heard of the Tuskegee experiments? Okay. So you know in these experiments, they were telling people that, hey, we have an, we have an end all and be all cure for your diseases when they were secretly injecting them with syphilis, right? Uh, yeah, and this, I mean, they, they uh, unfortunately, yes. <laughs> yeah, so uh, um, then you have Plessy versus Ferguson, all right, separate but equal. Okay, this was the landmark Supreme Court, separate equal. The Jim Crow laws, ap applying these things that are going into the separate but equal laws. So they would have a separate water fountain, separate buses, separate schools for people of color versus people that were white. But it wasn't equal. Okay, well, I mean, I would say it was supposed to be equal, but, but I mean, then they actually had laws against interracial marriages. Uh -huh. All right, now, 1664, Maryland passed the first British colony law against white women marrying people of color. 1691, our own commonwealth banned interracial marriages. All right? And as a minister or someone from the church, if I were to marry an interracial couple of that time, it would be a fine of 10,000 pounds. Now, in today's money, that would be equivalent of almost $2 million. Now, I know you're looking at the deacon, and you're like, wow, look at his deacon cross. He must have that kind of money, right? But I couldn't afford that kind of fine, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> and then, it's neat, on June 12th, which is my birthday, June 12th, 1967, Loving versus Virginia actually outlawed interracial marriage. You could actually, you could actually marry different races. Now, and then, of course, there's the big one, slavery. Okay? Now... Is that the only acts of racism that have happened in the world? No. 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 All right, and that's important, okay? The Japanese encampments, all right? So they were looking, they were gathering people of Japanese and placing them in internment camps. Mm -hmm. Executive order in 1966. The Jewish Holocaust, all right? They were killing them because they were Jews. All right, the Ukrainian Holocaust, same thing. So there's been examples of racism throughout of history, right? But this is not God's view for how we're supposed to interact with one another, all right? So I want to bring you to God's view so we can keep moving forward, okay? Now, with God's view, 
They're based on five Catholic social teachings. Okay? These are the five, and I'm going to interact with you for a little bit here. Man is very good, the personalistic norm. We're made for relationship. Labor versus capital and solidarity versus subsidiarity. Now, let me go with the first one here. Man is very good. How many of you were a little tired this morning? Raise your hand. All right. A little tired. A little tired of waking up. How many, when you woke up in the morning, got up, stretched, ah, looked in the mirror and said, I am very good. <laughs> Who said that? I, I'm the only one? <laughs> I thought that not this morning. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me, let me ask this. Now, all joking aside, let me ask you this. Why didn't you say that to yourself? God has made you very good. If you don't look at yourself and say, now, Grant, you don't have to pat yourself on the shoulders and stuff. But if you look at yourself and you don't see yourself as very good, you've bought into the same lie as racism has. You are very good. And you have to, every morning, remind yourself of that. And because you are very good, you need to share that goodness with others. That's the next part, the personalistic norm, right? When you look at your body, right? Adam and Eve, we go back to the beginnings here, Adam and Eve, Adam would have looked at Eve and said, wow, you look like you're meant to receive something. Eve would have looked at Adam and said, you look like you're meant to give something through your body. What are they meant to give and receive? True, authentic love. And when you can give and receive true, authentic love, that normalizes you. That's why John Paul II would call it the personalistic norm. We're meant to give and receive love, right? And because we're meant to give and receive love, we're meant to be in relationship. That brings us to piety. All right? If we're meant to love one another, we have to first be attached to love itself, who is God. We see God as Father, then we can see each other as sisters and brothers. And when you can see yourself as sisters and brothers, then you can start living in this picture that God originally had for us. All right. Next one. Labor versus capital. Now, let's do a little role play here. All right, I'm going to hire each one of you, all right? Who wants to work for me? Raise your hand. <laughs> all right, now you get to the question. Now you get to the right question. Now, I'm going to hire each one of you, but here's your project. Each one of you have to write a 10,000-page essay on some celebrity by the end of the week, you can't sleep until you finish. You can't spend time with your family. You just have to finish the project. Who wants to work for me now? Does it have to be a celebrity? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Nobody's raising their hand. Why? Because your labor right, the people doing a job is always important. The goal or the capital always should go under the dignity of the person, all right? We are actually meant to love people and use things, but sadly, we often use people for a goal that we love. That even includes, you're going to see when I get to this second, eradicating racism. You cannot degrade people for even a goal. That's wrong. Okay? And then we have the solidarity and subsidiarity. I'm going to get back to that later on. But you can see this picture. It's very beautiful. We're drowning in hatred. But the Lord is reaching his loving hands through the water, trying to pick us up, saying, get back.
to the original happiness you were made for. Okay. Now, acknowledging an elephant in the room here, all right? If you had to carry an elephant on your back, you can see my little picture here, mm -hmm. it would be heavy. Now, I know you're looking at the deacon's guns here and you're like, all right, deacon, I know you can do it. <laughs> But the elephant in the room is this, and I don't mind talking about tough topics. Is racism wrong? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, it is. But racism is not wrong because it happens to black people, or Latino people, or Asian people, or even white people. people. Racism is wrong, yes, because it happens to people. Period. All people deserve dignity. All people deserve love. No matter what your race is. All of us deserve to be loved. Because that's what God has made each of us for. Oh, bless your heart. I think you may need a little love. You look like you're what? <laughs> you look like you got drenched. <laughs> that's okay. No. <laughs> Now, if I were to ask you, how much does racism cost, along with rash judgment, what would you say? You mean in money? Yes, in money. No. How much does racism cost? You mean and rash judgment. Now, let me define this, what this is. So racism, remember our definition, is saying, you think that one race is superior or inferior, right? Rash judgment is looking at how someone looks and making a judgment against their intentions. Well, there are forces who are willing to spend a lot of money. Yeah, give me, a, give me, a, give me an account. Give me a specific number. A specific number of money? Yes, give me some money. Account I mean, give me, give me a number. <laughs> give, me, give me a number. Okay, billions. All right, somebody else, give me a number. Billions. Okay, billions. It's an agenda. Okay, yes. I, I need another amount. Somebody, just raise your hand. I'm going to call on some people, young people in the back. Trillions. Trillions. Give me a number. Um, six million. Okay, six million. All right. I can't put a number because it costs, it gets to the point where it costs too many dollars. Okay, yes. Okay, all right. Wait, you're, you're kind of getting to my point here. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, and remember this. The cost of racism and rash judgment is $5.58. Now I'm looking at your eyes, you're like, okay, Deacon, this is weird. But I'm, uh, <laughs> let me explain, because this, this is actually a monetary value that has a theological meaning. 58 cents. Why? Because it goes against the fifth and eighth commandment. Thou shalt not kill, and thou shalt not bear false judgment and false witness. When you tell somebody that their worth is degraded, you're better than them, or they're worse than you, that's a lie. That kills their soul. Fifth commandment. Eighth commandment, false witness. When you have other people buy into the lie that they are less than you, less than human, deserve to be treated like trash, deserve to be judged harshly because of the color of their skin, or the job that they work, or the occupation that they have. That's a lie, because then you see them not as a brother and sister of the Heavenly Father. You see them worse than the animals. 58 cents. Now why $5? <laughs> Why five dollars? See, if you would have came, you could have got this. All right. <laughs> Why five dollars? I'm showing this here. Okay. Abraham Lincoln is there. Okay. It's because of this. Now, 
Can you hold this for me? Sure. Just hold it up. All right, now. Five dollars. This is the money question. Because racism and rash judgment can be defined by the same five words. The absence of God's love. None of us... Yes. Stole my thunder there. Say that again. <laughs> what? Like, yeah, just say that again. In God we trust. In God we trust. In God we find love. Nobody... Where's the crucifix in here? Okay, okay sorry. Okay, so... He died so that none of us would be absent of God's love. Who are we to say, I don't care that you died. You don't deserve that love. Who are we to say that? $5.58 for rash judgment and for racism. This is a price that none of us should ever pay. So now we're going to start comparing the ideologies. Okay. If we're not meant to be and have God's love absent in our lives, we have to be careful where we're rooted. Now, Archbishop Gomez from Los Angeles, he gave an address on November 4th, 2021. And he talked about it. He says, we have to be careful because what's happening is some ideologies are actually turning into pseudo-religions. What is the purpose of religion? To bring us to God. God. Yes. It's supposed to connect us to God. And just like there's a, a really good man, I should say God-man, who said, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, or, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Where your roots are, where you're rooted will depend on what kind of fruits you are going to bear up. So you have to know where are you rooting your ideology. Imagine this. Close your eyes, everybody. Again, like I said, I'm going to interact with you. Close your eyes. Okay. Now I want for you to picture you're out in a field. The sun is shining on you. It's hot. It's like 100 degree hot. You are so thirsty. And then you see two pieces of your favorite fruit. Whatever that favorite fruit is, put that in your mind. You go and pick that fruit up. The first piece of fruit you bite into it, the juice is dripping down your mouth, you're licking the juice, feel the refreshment. And the second piece of fruit, you bite into it, it's brown, has bugs flying out of it, and a worm's crawling out of it. All right, now open your eyes. All right. Now I'm going to reflect what your faces looked like, okay? <laughs> when I talked about the first fruit, it was kind of like... <laughs> the second one was like... And you literally, you could hear people say, oh, oh! We need to eat good fruit, which means we need to have good roots. This is why we're going to compare these, okay? Now... Critical race theory. This is going to be one of our roots. Okay. Let's look at it again. I'm going to read the rest of page three here now. Oops, sorry, let's go. We read that it, it was supposed to include the economics, the group self-interest, and stuff like that. But then it says, unlike traditional civil rights discourse, which stresses incrementalism and step-by-step -step progress, Critical race theory questions the very foundations of the liberal order. Questions the very foundations 
of the order. Now, this is going to be four things that CRT is going to be based off of, okay, when we're looking at its roots, okay? The first one, deconstruction, all right? This is breaking down the order, all right? How society works, it's deconstruction. Now, how many of you work with kids or have grandchildren or anything like that, right? You watch them build Lego towers, right? And then they want to build another one. You knock it down. Is that a bad thing? No. No, they're just building another one. But what if truth and goodness is the thing you're trying to knock down? If you're trying to deconstruct how society operates, not on truth and goodness, but on something else. Let's deconstruct. All right, that's deconstruction. The next one, I'm going to play a video for you. Again, like I said, I'm going to use firsthand sources here. This is a video from Jared Ball introducing Patrice Colors. All right? I want to play the context of this video for you, just so you don't think I'm taking it out of, out of context here. So this is a guy, he has a show, um, he was interviewing Patrice Kalor, and she, he was interviewing about what is the history of Black Lives Matter, oh. okay? He has a show called The Real News, and I'm going to play part of his interview with Patrice Kalors, okay? Let me see. Critique, as I would want to point out, by the way, uh, is that he was concerned or is concerned that, uh, that there's a lack of perhaps uh, uh, ideological direction in Black Lives Matter that would allow it to be, to, to, to fizzle out, in, as he said, um, uh, in comparison to Occupy Wall Street. Uh, as you all are advanced in your own organization, as you all are headed to Cleveland to participate in this Black Lives uh, Movement conference, how do you respond to that particular critique? Again, a loving critique from an elder of the struggle uh, that some others share, uh, that I've even shared as well, to, to be frank, as a concern about, uh, in part because of the co-optation and, and the appropriation, that, that a, a more clear ideological um, structuring might be of some value here. But how do you respond to, to, to those kinds of, uh, again, loving criticisms? Now listen to her response. Um, I think that the criticism is helpful. Um, I also think that it might, um, I think of a lot of things. The first thing I think is that we actually do have an ideological frame. Um, myself and Alicia in particular are trained organizers. Um, we uh, are trained Marxists. Um, we are uh, super, uh, versed um, on sort of ideological theories. And I think that what we really try to do is build a movement that could be utilized by many, many black folk. Um, we don't necessarily want to be the vanguard um, of this movement. I think we've tried to put out a political frame that's about um, centering who we think are the most vulnerable amongst the black community to, to really fight for all of our lives. Okay. Um, and I do think that. So you heard in her own words, she said, our ideology is Marxism, okay? Now, Marxism is about, in its very nature, it's about power. What Marx said was, okay, there is a synthesis, an oppressor, and then there's someone who is being oppressed, okay? Antithesis. When they keep going against each other, eventually they keep fighting, and eventually one overcomes the other, then you get a synthesis. That's how you keep progressing through history, all right? So life is about power. The way that we should live should be about a power struggle. All right. Next, the third root, Sigmund Freud. He had something called the pleasure principle. All right. Now the pleasure principle 
says, and it's not an old Janet Jackson song, okay, but. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. <go> ahead. <laughs> but the pleasure principle actually says, you exist for me. Now, if I went up to you, imagine, imagine that I'm walking up to you and I say, hey, how are you doing? Just, just interact with me here. I'm doing fine. How are you doing? Well, that doesn't matter because you exist for me. <laughs> how would you take that? Oh, no. I don't know. <laughs> good answer. Good answer. She said, oh, no, you do, uh, you do not, right? I do not exist for you. The pleasure principle, all right, saying that you exist for me. Okay? And then the fourth root of this, we're going to go back to Genesis 3. All right? We're talking about, I'm going to read this to you. The snake said to the woman, You certainly will not die. God knows well that when you eat of your, the fruit, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God's who know good and evil. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked. The eyes of both of them were opened. Now, when you go to sleep and you open your eyes, what do you call that? Open your eyes. Waking up. Yes, yes, open your eyes. Waking up. You become woke. Right? Now, the, this term woke actually is a southern term that actually meant being enlightened, right? But it's been corrupted. Now, woke, when people are saying this, like, you know what your white identity is. You know that this stuff is wrong. I determine what's good and evil. I determine whether you're racist or not. I determine what your intentions are. I have this knowledge, and this knowledge is what will make me free, happy, and save me, and will save society. Now, having a knowledge equal to salvation, the church has already dealt with this. This was the heresy of Gnosticism. Okay, when it said knowledge is equal to salvation and power. Okay, so if you're looking at the roots of CRT, questioning the liberal order, where did my book go? Okay. Marxism, played the video for you. The pleasure principle, you exist for me. All right, so we, and then Gnosticism, this knowledge, I need to decide what's good and evil. These are the roots of CRT. Now let's compare them to the Catholic worldview. Okay? We look at deconstruction. And this, if we have to break down how society is based on truth, and we have to base it on our truth, Catholic worldview says truth is objective. Why is that important? What is truth? Yes, it's a person. He objectively exists. I can't speak over Jesus. We can't deconstruct Jesus. Otherwise, we get a false Jesus, a false God, a new religion, as Archbishop Gomez would say. All right? Marxism. The church has spoken against Marxism and communism. I'm going to read you two quotes. Pope Pius XI, the Vini Ribbon Torres. He says, we wish to expose once more in a brief synthesis the principles of atheistic communism. And it says, I'm going to read this last sentence to you. Christian civilization, the true civitas humana, can and should be saved from this satanic scourge. He called it a satanic scourge. Pius IX, Gnostis et Nobiscum. He says, he's talking to us clergy. Pius XI is going to call it a satanic surge. He's scourged. He says, these are going to profane all law, human and divine, destroy divine worship, and subvert the entire ordering civil societies. Then he says, clergy. 
because he's writing this to clergy. He said, it is your duty, venerable brethren, to help the faithful realize that if they let themselves be deceived by such perverted doctrines and theories, these theories will call their temporal and eternal destruction. Clergy have to stop this stuff. Yes. Right? You have to. He says, eternal destruction. And why am I hammering this home? It's because I want all of you in heaven with me. As clergy, and I'm sure I can speak for Father on this too, we want you in heaven with us. And that's where, yeah, and that's where we are talking to. Yes, yes, yes. This is why this is so important. Yes, <laughs> this is why this is so important. <laughs> um, next slide. <laughs> no, no, but thank you. No, thank you for that in all seriousness. Now, Freud's pleasure principle. Remember, you exist for me. But as Catholics, as Christians, we need to have the Eucharistic principle. Not this is your body given up for me, but this is my body given up for you. Not about power, but service. Our Lord said, I came not to be served, but to serve. We're called to imitate Christ. And then Gnosticism. It's not the secret knowledge that saves us. It's the knowledge of Christ. Okay? And I just want to point out 1 Timothy 6, 20 through 21. Already in the New Testament, they're already condemning Gnosticism. All right? So that's a verse right there. And you have St. Irenaeus in the second century. He says, Let those persons, therefore, who blaspheme the Creator, he says, blaspheme the Creator, those of Valentinius and all the Gnostics falsely so-called be recognized as agents of Satan. They're very harsh with this stuff because salvation is important. Okay, again, and this is not throwing shade. I'm just trying to get you to see where the roots are. This is why I'm doing this. Again, we're not going after persons. We're going after ideologies. Okay, and that's very important. Okay. So, the next part. Who here has ever heard of a social Jedi officer? All right. Now, this is an acronym, all right, where they call you the different states. It's social, and then it's justice, equity, diversity, and inclusivity. All right? Jedi. Now, normally when you think about this, you're like, Jedi? I am your father. All right? <laughs> but... In, in some schools and stuff, they will call them social Jedi officers, or they may call them Dei officers, D-E-A, uh, D-E-I, sorry, Dei. Now, ironically, that's also the word for God. Now, in some counties, as I give these talks all over the, the nation, some of them have replaced equity with empathy, which I actually think is a good thing because that involves walking rather than we're going to talk about equity for a second. But let's look at these terms. Okay. Diversity. This is embracing various cultures and individuality. This is subsidiarity. In and of itself, it is not bad. Your culture is not a bad thing. Okay. This is hitting back to that Catholic social teaching of subsidiarity, the individual. All right. But then inclusivity also by itself is not a bad thing. This is uniting all the cultures, right? We're different cultures, but we're all united. Just like on the dollar bill, where it says, e pluribus unum, from many one, right? What happens is when we try to separate them, we try to be all inclusive or all diverse. That's when you get into problems. And this is where the CRT is saying, no, we have to eradicate whiteness. That's bad, because the white culture has something good to contribute to society. We can't try to eradicate the black culture. Right? We can't try to eradicate the Latino culture. All of us have something good to contribute. 
Now, this also images the Trinity. Everybody, shout out. Who are the three persons in God? All right, good. All right. If, if, if I was the DRA, I'd say, like, yeah, okay, you all can get confirmed now, right? <laughs> but the Trinity, they are one God, three persons. The Father does not degrade the Son by giving of himself. The Holy Spirit doesn't say, okay, well, I have to hold back a little of myself, otherwise I'm going to offend the Son. They all give completely. From three, there is one. And that's what love is meant to do. Inclusivity and diversity are meant to come together. Now let's look at this word equity. Okay, now, I'm going to do something here. You all are not going to be able to see me in this, but you all understand what I'm about to do in a second. Okay, now. I want you to take this. I want for you to take this. Let's see. Well, you work here, so you can. <laughs> I want you to take this. Yeah. <laughs> Your father just said, come out the parish. Yeah, right, this is right. Yeah. I want you to take this. Now, if you just got something, stand up. All right. And just tell everybody what you got. Okay. Six dollars. Seven dollars. Twenty dollars. All right. Now let me ask you this: Is that fair? No. No. <laughs> now listen to this. There's a mix. So this is what we're looking at in equity here. Okay. There is. Half the room said yes. The people that got money all said yes. Because there's so many reasons why, based on us, that you gave these amounts. Yes, yes. Okay, now. Say that again. Because of who we are, that you may have chosen this unique amount to give, to give us individually. Based on merit. Okay, all right. So, all based on merit, that means you're the holiest person in here. So, <laughs> <laughs> now, but but in order to see if that's fair or not, you have to know. I'm looking for one word. Why? Yes, why? Right. So, when we're looking at this, okay, let's give a round of applause to our people that have the money. The people that have my money, please, at the end of the at the end of the talk, please give it back to me. <laughs> but, but sit down just so I can finish the talk here. <laughs> but now, equity by Abram Kendi, ex Kendry, and this is in his book How to Be Anti Racist. He writes, a racist policy is any measure that produces or sustains racial equity between two racial groups. There is no such thing as a non-racist or race-neutral policy. Every policy in every institution, in every community, in every nation is producing or either sustaining racial, racial equity or inequity between racial groups. The defining question is whether discrimination is creating equity or inequity. Someone reproducing inequity, though permanently assisting an overrepresented racial group into wealth and power, is entirely different than someone challenging that inequity by temporarily assisting an un underrepresented racial group into relative wealth and power until equity can be reached. Yes, this is, yeah, this is a very long sentence. <laughs> now, the, the big thing is with this, it's just about what's fair. Now, you all have just shown through that little exercise there that fairness can be subjective. So who determines to be fair? This is the danger of this definition of equity. Who determines what's fair? Right? And also, the danger with this definition of equity is this. It says, if you're doing something to an overrepresented group, which we would call a majority, and not towards a minority, that means that you're racist. Does that mean... If there's someone who's in a majority group, I say, 
a white person who has special needs? Should we not serve them because they're an overrepresented group? Right? Or let's say there's someone who has a lot of money and they need help at a hospital thing. Should we not help them because they have a lot of money? You see the problem? If each of us individually, no matter what our race is, deserves our human dignity, it shouldn't matter how much money you have or if you're overrepresented or underrepresented. You should love just because you should love. Right, so there has to be more to equity. Uh oh. So here's an, a different definition here. This one talks about a fair, inclusive, and respectful treatment for all people. Can we hit that fair part? Okay. Now, what's the best definition of equity? It must be connected to justice. Not fairness, but to justice. Why? Because justice is objective. You have either divine law, natural law, or civil law that should be in line with divine law. Justice must be connected to equity because then you can measure it out. Okay. So this comes from John Paul II's definition of equity. He says, in the church, equity is an expression of charity and truth. Notice it's connected to truth, something objective. Aiming at a higher justice, which coincides with the supernatural good of the individual. We help people because we want to get them to heaven. Not because we're in a power struggle. Okay. This is John Paul II's address to the U.S. bishops in 1998, section 3, if you want the quote. Okay. Now, for this last part, so you can see kind of the difference here in my little slide here. So you can see the difference. Equality, equity, then justice. Okay. In the justice part, we don't have to try to manipulate people or the situation in order for everybody to see, right? Because it's based on everybody's dignity. So now let's look at solutions, okay? And this will conclude my talk. How do we actually heal the culture? First, we have to remember we're made in the image and likeness of God. We oftentimes hear about this with critical race theory about privilege. We're thinking about money, or we're thinking about whiteness, or we're thinking about our color. But we forget about the greatest privilege that all of us have, to be sons and daughters of God, to be made in the love of God, in his image and likeness. That's our greatest privilege. That's the privilege that we need to focus on, not on whether people have money or what their color of their skin is, that brings me to, so this is human dignity. This is the second thing. If we realize our dignity, then we can encourage each other in love, right? Now, in the Song of Songs, chapter 1, verse 5, it actually says, I am black and beautiful. Beauty comes with truth and goodness. There's another clip. I just don't have the time to play it because I want to get your questions. But it talks about that same clip that I had showed you all with Patrice Calores. It talks about that we were built on black rage. Right? Now, with privilege, you think about this. All right? People that have money, raise your hand again. All right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> gotcha. No, it's like, <laughs> raise your money because I'm going yeah, to do this. Raise your money here. Now, everybody else, look at those bills in the air. Right? You could be jealous that you don't have that. Jealousy says, you have something that I want. All right? But there's a slippery slope because jealousy then can sometimes lead to envy. You have something that I want and I hate you for it. That's privilege. That's what this privilege word is. You have something that I want, and I hate you for it. 
but it gets worse. And I've seen this happen. It goes from jealousy to envy to wrath. Not, you have something I want, envy, and I hate you for it. But now it's simply, I hate you. These are not beautiful. And they're anti-scriptural. Because, sorry, hit the wrong button. Sorry. <laughs> First John tells us, if you say you love God and hate your brother, you are a liar. How can we love the brother we can see and also love the God that we cannot see if we're rooted in jealousy, envy, or hatred, or wrath. That doesn't make us beautiful. And when I talk to African-American communities, I tell them this. Black is meant to be beautiful, but wrath is not beautiful. Love is. Okay. Next. Looking at instructing the ignorant. Now, all of us, we look at this, right? He has information overload, right? <laughs> <laughs> but we have to, as you were saying, we have to talk about this stuff. We have to instruct people. A lot of times what happens in these situations, and I want to be very clear, you do need to listen to people so you can take in where they're at, right? Say, okay, what's going on here? But oftentimes, the biggest thing that separates us is breakdowns in communications. Now, I had three years at Divine Mercy University, and most of these communication things are based off of what are called cognitive distortions. They're ways that we think that take us outside of reality. And I'm going to give you uh, some examples here. All right, so there's one. An overgeneralization. All right, this is a, kind of the first one here. So I went to college, and at college they had these religious sisters, right? And they all spoke Spanish. And my Spanish is, as I've said, a CSC, right? <laughs> so we were going to breakfast one time, and they had these, they were cooking these eggs and bacon and stuff, and I was like, and I wanted to tell the sisters, I was like, oh, sisters, this is great. Do you smell this? And then I went up to them, these are table of religious sisters, and I said, tienen hombre. And then they all start cracking up laughing. They're like, ha, 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 like, They're like, Gerardo, do you know what you've just said? I said, yeah, are you hungry? And they said, no, you've just asked us, do we have a man, right? <laughs> <laughs> so then the next day, they come up to me, and they said, See, Gerardo, no man today, right? Now, <laughs> this is an overgeneralization. Uh, I'm using that in a jokey mood, but then I'm going to talk about it in seriousness. You're thinking, because I've had a bad experience, now every time I see a sister, I'm going to think she has a man, right? <laughs> but getting back to this problem, okay, let's say that like, say you grew up in Mississippi and you actually, like in my grandma's town, they actually still do have the blacks and whites live on separate sides of the railroad tracks in my, my grandma's town, Louisiana. That doesn't mean that every town wants to separate people by blacks and whites. Or if you have a bad situation in, in school, like maybe somebody yells at you, or they may say something derogatory towards you, that doesn't mean like, let's say that it was a white person who said that. That doesn't mean every time you talk to a white person, they're going to say something derogatory towards you. This is a cognitive distortion of overgeneralization. Okay? Emotional reasoning. Let's say, and I, I do like people, but let's say I was a little nervous for this talk, right? And I start sweating profusely. I'm like, whew, it's getting hot here. Now, because I'm feeling hot, does that mean that automatically the room is going to turn into 120 degrees and everybody's going to start sweating? The sun will come out? The thunder will stop? No. No, right? 
<laughs> no, I am not one of the X-Men, right? <laughs> no, just because you feel something, that doesn't mean that that will make reality. Emotions don't make reality. Reality makes reality. All right? This is an emotional reasoning. Because you feel something, that means that you project it onto everybody else. And that brings me to this third cognitive distortion, which is called jumping to conclusions. Without checking something out, you just automatically assume that someone has a negative kind of vibe against you. I walk up to you. Oh, she hates me. Oh, she didn't compliment my suit, right? I, I don't, do you hate me? No. <laughs> but if, for me to conclude that she hates me, just based off of nothing, that's called jumping to conclusions. That's a cognitive distortion. You can see if you have these mindsets, how it will put up walls and make people think that you hate them. It prevents relationships from happening, all right? Next one, admonishing the sinner, all right? Sin, so you hear about this in these books. Unconscious sin. You're an unconscious racist. You don't know that you're racist, but I know you're racist. Unconsciously, you're racist. Is racism a sin? Yes. Yes. What do you need for sin to take place? Full consent. Full consent. Full knowledge. And if it's mortal, serious matter, right? Mm -hmm. You cannot unconsciously sin. So you cannot be unconsciously racist. <laughs> right? I mean, it's, just imagine if the world is working like this. Dum -de -dum -de -dum -de -dum -de -dum. You're racist. Dum -de -dum -de -dum -de -dum. You're racist too, right? I mean, that's not how the word, world works. You have to consciously choose racism because you have to consciously choose not to love. And racism is a sin against love, right? But also, you must also forgive. Maybe you have been hurt. Maybe you have experienced a racist um, remark or something like that. You must forgive. And why do you need to forgive? It's because of this. God has made each of us with unique dignity. And we're meant to be free to love. And by the very act that someone looks at you or says something to you and it ruins your day, and makes you buy into the lie that you are not worth anything or that your dignity is worth less than theirs. Nobody is ever meant to have that kind of power over you. Nobody should be able to ruin your day just by looking at you. We forgive if you've done everything to correct the wrong because we're meant to be free, not to be bound down by hatred or distrust. We must forgive, even if you have been wronged. And then the last thing we're going to do, to heal the culture, we need to pray in our Father. Now, everybody, let's pray one together, yep. all right? Now, just so you know, there's, there's more on here. It's just, just, <laughs> uh, okay, so let's pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Stop! Did you hear... And that's good, you were finishing a prayer. Good job, good job. But did you hear what you just said? You said, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. You just said, even prayed, that I will be forgiven, God, to the degree that I forgive others. 
that I hold grudges against other people, even against people's ancestors. Put that into the context of what you're hearing in all these people when you talk about reparations and stuff. We need to forgive. Now, let me ask you this. Jesus, true God and true man, yes or yes? Yes. yes. All right. Good answer. All right, good. All right, now, <laughs> now, as man, true God and true man, as man, Jesus had a race. What race was Jesus? Jewish. Jewish, Jewish all right. Now, I'm going to do something here. So this is going, we're going for the mercy, okay? Now, here's a stat. Remember what you just said, because I just asked you about the race of Jesus. But I want to get for something here. If we're going to forgive others as we've forgiven people, we're just talking about the reparations and stuff. In 1830, a historian, Carter Woodson, he said that the black population, 13.7% of it was free. Of those freed slaves, 3,776 of them owned black slaves. Does that mean black people should hate black people? No. no. All right, let's keep going. Now, again, what race was Jesus? Jewish. All right. Now, was there anybody who ever did anything bad to the Jewish people? Yes. Ever enslaved the Jewish people? Yes. Hmm. All right. Who were they? Let's, let's, let's name them out. All right, Pharaoh, the Egyptians, yes. Africans, okay? Who else? Romans. The Assyrians, all right, the Romans. Who here, who here can speak French or Italian, Spanish, yeah, I Portuguese, <laughs> all right? All Romance languages, Roman languages, right? All right, so the Romans, we have the Egyptians or the Africans. Who else? Who else har harmed Jesus' race? Okay. All right, the Germans, okay, we're going to associate them kind of with the Romans. Okay, all right, Russians, all right. Who else? Okay, well, <laughs> well, well we're going to consider them as the Egyptians, okay, because the Africans, the Africans, okay. All right, but look at this. The Assyrians, the Persians, the Greeks. If you're going to go into all the people that persecuted Jesus' race, and he was to hold a grudge against them. He would have to hold a grudge or condemn the entire world. But wait. I think there's a Bible verse about that. John 3, 16 through 17. God so loved the world and gave his one and only son begotten. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now listen to this part in verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save it. If Jesus isn't going to condemn people with racial hatred as Christians, how can we say we can. We do not know better than God. And we were made for love. This Our Father reminds us of this. So in conclusion, and then I can get some questions here. We have to stand on two feet. Not just our feelings or emotions. but on truth, goodness, human dignity. And as we stand, we have to look where are we rooted? Are we rooted in CRT, which is based on deconstruction, Marxism, Gnosticism, and Freudism? You exist for me. Are we, are we rooted in the gospel, the love of God, who's taken flesh, Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, and who told us, I have told you these things so my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. If we want complete joy, we must be rooted 
in God, in love, and not critical race theory. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, I think we have about some time for questions. So are there any questions? Didn't mean to leave you spellbound. <laughs> yes, go ahead. What is, what is wrong with striving for equal opportunity? So now this is the thing. Equal opportunity in and of itself is not bad. The difference, and this is with equity, the difference is equal opportunity does not mean equal outcome or result. That's the thing you have to realize. Because honestly, that's just not reality. All of us have different gifts. And St. Catherine of Siena, in her dialogues, the Lord actually addressed this. He says, Dear Lord, why do some people have certain gifts and others don't? Like for me, I can't draw to save my life. I mean, it's, if, if someone were to give me an A in an art class, that would be a lie because I can't draw, right? But the reason that God gives us different gifts, all right, in outcome is because that brings us to charity. We depend on everything. Everything that we depend on, we can't get from just ourselves. And because we can't do everything ourselves, which would lead to pride and egoism, and we're dependent on others, that means that we have to love others because we have to depend on others. So the equality is not bad in and of itself as long as you don't just narrow it to an equality of outcome. Okay? So like even, even whether it's economics, like we don't all make the same amount of money, right? Um, and talents, we don't all have the same gifts. Now we can provide opportunities for everybody to do their best, which is where I think your question is going towards. Right? We do need to provide opportunities for everybody to do their best, but that doesn't mean degrading others in justice, because it has to be connected to justice, in order to help them to get that equal outcome. It's a good question. Okay, I'm gonna go one and then two. Okay. Oh. Yeah, yeah, you're, yeah, you're good. Yeah. Oh, yes, 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 thank you, thank you. Um, also, what you were talking about, was it your mother or grandmother, you said, really is living in... Oh, her town, yeah, in Jennings, yeah, in yeah. Jennings, Jennings, Louisiana. And so what were you saying about se se segregation? So, yeah, so in, in Jennings, they still actually have the whites live on one side of the railroad tracks and the blacks live on the other side. Now, they do cross over with one another. Like, my, my godmother actually is white, right? So they intermix, but I'm saying, like, if you were coming just from a purely objective standpoint, you would think, oh, well, all towns in the South are racist because they've separated each other. But, I mean, that doesn't mean, and that's what I was giving that as an example. So, yeah. Right. They, yeah. But they, well, they have the, um, they don't have, they have, like, the, Yeah, they can cross into each other's sections. So yeah, yeah, so yes, yeah, they can cross into each other's sections. Oh, okay. But just the way that they that they're arranged, just that's how it is. So. Oh, I'm sorry. But yeah, you're welcome. Wanting to hold on to their own culture on both sides. Well, it could be. I mean, but absolutely, I mean, because uh, how do you get them together when they are so staid in, in their uh, culture? Yeah. So her culture is so. Yes, so her question was about how do you get people to interact when you have different cultures? Like I said... And when they're not particularly wanting to do that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think you have to go down to the, the fundamental question of, okay, even the purpose of culture, right? At the root of culture is what? Really, people gather together because they want to be loved, yeah. right? And they like the sameness. Too. Yeah, and they have, they have, they have things in common, right? Yeah. But this gets back to what is our ultimate, fundamental, basic identity? Children of God, yeah. right? Why? I know. Difficult to get these two groups together. It'd be a very difficult. Yeah, you have to find, and I would say, so this is more of this is more me uh, working with things. Yeah, you have to find things that are in common where people will right. want to come together. Yeah, they don't but, hate each other. 
Sure. Yeah, and I mean, and that's what you have to realize, that, that brick wall of being able to say, no, look, we don't hate each other. Yeah. That's huge. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times, again, you talk about the cognitive distortions there, people will think you hate them even though they actually don't. You know? Um, yeah, so you get together. I mean, honestly, you bring them together. I mean, honestly, when we have family reunions and stuff, where you get both, both sides to come together, barbecue, right? <laughs> we, we, we eat. I mean, that's what yeah. <laughs> say it. So, yeah. 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 So, good question. Yes, and good question. Thank you. All right, you're next, and then yes. Okay. Right. Deacon Anthony, do you think that race relations in the United States have declined, say, in the past 25 years? And if so, why? Well, I mean, I think, I think it's been kind of a roller coaster. I think in the last few years, it's actually, they kind of amped it up because I think society is amping up things like with this critical race theory, to be honest with you. Uh, yes, I mean, I, it's, it's, been, it's been rough because I've talked to teens that actually were really good friends with people of opposite races. And then when all of this stuff started exploding, they were like, oh, um, you're racist. I have actually talked with groups because I help counsel people and help with healing where people actually will say like, okay, my mom is racist because she's an army officer or she's a police officer. Mm -hmm. and you're like, uh, no, she's always been a police officer. That doesn't mean she's racist. And they're like, no, 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 but that's, that's, that's what, she's uh, in a, a racist job, you know, and it's like, you have to tear that down. So I think people amping up hatred actually has elevated all of this stuff in the and last years. Agenda. Yeah, I mean, Not I... from a global agenda, it is. Yeah, because, I mean, it's... Here's the thing, and I'll, I'll, I'll say this to, to kind of conclude this question here. There was a, an old Chinese parable. This guy was coming up, and he was a young guy. He went up to his sensei, and he said, okay, sensei, I'm ready to work. He says, okay. I want you to go and bring me a stick. So he goes and brings the sensei the stick. He chops it in half. He says, go bring me another one. Chops it in half. Keeps doing a third, fourth, fifth, about 10 of them. Keeps breaking them in half. The kid starts getting mad. He's like, sensei, why do you keep breaking the sticks? He's like, well, OK, now I want you to go and get me a string. He ties them all together. He says, now look at this. These strings, when you present it to me individually, they were easily broken, these sticks. But together, they are very, very tightly bond, bounded. They can't be broken. The devil likes to separate. All right? Actually, I mean, and this is one of the things, even in rules of discernment, isolation is equal to desolation. Community, so like sometimes we need to be alone, but we should never be isolated, feel like we're on our own, because the devil can more easily attack us. You think the devil wants to fight an individual in the church? You think he wants to fight the entire mystical body? We have to work on doing the mystical body, so get back to your question. In society, even over these last 25 years, we have to stop falling into this isolation, we're trying to isolate and put people against one another. We have to grow in love. And I think when we have things that are rooted in hatred, like critical race theory, we're going down the wrong path. And if we keep putting these in schools and, and education and stuff like that, it can only get worse because people are being rooted in the very thing that's antithetical to their humanity, hatred instead of love? So, good question. All right. you. You're welcome. Yes? So, uh, getting back to your grandmother's pattern of white people on one side and black people on the other side of the track. Yes. Baltimore is full of that. Mm -hmm. Because you have righteous town road, the fastest way from Africa to Israel is righteous town road. Yeah. Uh, okay. Little Italy, you know, they all just kind of stuck together yeah, cultural, yeah, it's, I mean, yeah. different things, yeah. It's uh, a lot yeah, and that's, so, yeah, that's, that is a good point. He said in Baltimore they have different kinds of um, ethnicities that kind of group together, um, not out of hatred, but just because that's what they gathered. So, 
Yes, that's where they choose to live. So, so that is true. Yes. Speak their culture. Yes. And that's understandable. Yes. Yeah. So good point. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So the question was, she was talking about with critical race theory, it seems like it's kind of based off of just issues, issues with, with Caucasians or white people. So she's like, how do black people view Caucasians or whites? Is that what you're saying, right? Now, to be fair, and this is kind of what I'm saying uh, in the thing, not, yeah, not all black people will think the same. Like, I mean, honestly, I love white people. You know? <laughs> Right, um, and even and I would even say this: even even people that adhere to this theory, the critical race theory, I wouldn't say that they would say they don't love white people as well, but they would say that their whiteness is the thing that's holding back black people, right? And I mean, and 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 that's where I think you have to be careful because I mean, honestly, if all we're looking about, and this is where I'm talking about the outcome, yeah. the outcome. Life isn't about just achieving the same outcomes as others. With that, you're destined to go down the road of envy and jealousy, right? You have to be able to look at service, not power, because honestly, we need to look at each other and each other's gifts, not as privileges that need to be getting rid of, but as blessings that should be used to serve one another. So. Yeah, so I mean, I, I, think, I think that's crucial. You know, I think that's very crucial. And I mean, it can start with just having, you know, conversations and stuff like that. Just, you know, go up. Just know that you're loved. It's so. all based on people's, um, ex each, each individual people's experiences. Yes. And that's what you have to do is you have to take people's experiences, but then you have to elevate them with your experience and then help go together forward towards Christ. I mean, that ultimately, every interaction with another person, if the goal is heaven, you want to be able to help them to come closer to God. Right, so, good question. Thank you. Right. And when then, did critical uh, race theory, when did they begin teaching it in schools? Well, in schools, so technically, so in its, in its origins, you had the civil rights era, right? Mm -hmm. People started trying to make laws to make races have equal law. So it originally started off as a law theory, critical race law, right? But then it ended up getting hijacked, all right? That was about 1979. I mean, it, it, honestly, it just it started getting hijacked. It became more than just, okay, equal equality laws. It became more about, okay, now we need to change the economics, the culture, the way people think. Um, even getting into higher education, like if you want to say like higher education, middle school, elementary schools, when did that start coming around? Um, it, I would say it's somewhat been around since the 70s, but it became very popular probably about maybe six, seven years ago, like really like forcing it on people. They've had, they've had racial studies as undergrads for years now, but to try to implement it into schools like bluntly and blatantly, that's more of a recent phenomenon. I mean, not just focusing on the cultural racial aspect, but more of the cultural power struggle. That's more of a new thing. Um, but I would say um, what we can do is make sure that we teach now, because you can't change the past, right? We teach our children to love one another, to look at the heart and not just the skin color or the theory. And that's how we'll transform, and hopefully one day this stuff will be out of the culture. I mean, so, good question, thank you. One. I think a good portion of this, from uh, 60s and 50s and everything, this is being instigated. It's been instigated for a long time in watching all of this because in the areas that I lived in and all the different that I met, it never dawned on anybody. We were taught, everybody
everybody's code lines and everything else, and we all live together fine. But it was the instigation of the politicians and the people who want the control, just like you said, yeah. you'll work for me. Yeah, I mean, we're going to work for them, and that's how they gain control. So all of this, they make it so that people that can't, I think, not even think for themselves or they're lacking something. Yeah. And they I they grab onto this and they just keep working the whole thing until everybody's going crazy. Yeah, we want to, and I think this is the thing, and you have to remember, like, you won't choose something unless you see it as a good, right? So Aquinas says, okay, the good, and this is where in order to heal, you have to look at people, because it's like, yeah, some of this stuff, yeah, you're right, it, it is being instigated. But at the same time, at their heart of hearts, what they're saying is, hey, I want my value to feel felt. And sometimes they may think the only way that we can do this is by, when you have a comparative mentality versus a contributive mentality, if you're always comparing yourself to other people, you're gonna always feel that. That's human nature. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, but here's the thing though, with the lens of the eyes though, you have to be careful because if you're always comparing, you're gonna always have to feel the need to cut other people down so that you can appear taller, right? But if you have a contributive mentality, each of us have gifts that we can use for building each other up and helping society make a better place, then you can actually start working. So I would say even with the, uh, the color blindness, I would say this, we don't have to, have to be blind to the color, no. we just have to remember that each color is beautiful yeah. and it can come into a beautiful tapestry. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, that's what the church wants, is for every tapestry to be part of that beautiful tapestry of the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. So that is, that is a good point. So thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. I think we got one, two, and then I think well, within. I, okay. I have to say both. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know. My question is maybe too vague and too general, but it seems to me that um, part of our fallen nature is, is, is this wanting to find a scapegoat. Okay, so that's what happened in Germany. Um, economic problems, well, let's find a scapegoat yeah. to fix the Jews, mm -hmm. all right? So it's happening now, you know? Um, you need to find a scapegoat. Oh, it's your whiteness. That's, so we're gonna, you know, blame you and you're gonna be the problem. How do you fight that kind of, um, since it's this institutional kind of, and it's, and it's preying on the weaknesses that we all have of, yeah. You know, what does what does someone like me do? Like you're doing so much because you're a teacher and you're educating and you're giving us this seminar and you're going around the country and you're <coughs> teaching. So what does somebody like me do? I mean, how do I? Yeah. You know. So the question was, what is something that I can do to make a difference? I'm going to show you. Hi, I'm Deacon Anthony. You know, if somebody who, someone who may, they may have actually had bad experiences. They may be bitter. But if you can come up and just do a simple handshake, smile, and you show people you are worth my time, that can knock down walls. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be the, uh, yeah, genuineness. And I would say, and, and this is one of the things I would say too, oh, sorry. Um, this is <laughs> one of the things that we, like when people are thinking about systemic or systematic stuff, they're thinking macro level. But often love has to work at the micro level. If we're gonna change a society, we have to change it. This is from Mother Teresa, not me. One person at a time. Love one person at a time. And if each of us, I mean, even just the people in this room, if each of us just chose five people just to love, it's going to be about, what, maybe 300 people that now know that they're loved. And she mentioned the scapegoat, and this is one of the things, too. The reason I mentioned love is because love points us to the true scapegoat. Back in Exodus, they would actually lay the sins of the people on this goat and send them out into the desert. That's where you actually get the term from, right? 
that scapegoat, the sins were laid upon this goat and sent out into the desert. Our sins are laid upon not a goat, but a God-man. And when you can love others with the love of Christ, that's the small but profound thing that you can do to help others to get beyond this. So that's a great question. and that's a, I think that's a good question to end on. So um, let us, Father, can I ask for you to give us a blessing? And uh, thank you all. If, if anybody wants to talk afterwards, I'm, I'll sit here and, and uh, talk with you a little bit more too. But um, you all have been a great audience. Thank you all. And God bless you. So. <laughs>